Dear students, welcome to this session of my lecture on architecture and programming models for GPUs and coprocessors. We're still talking about rendering algorithms and we're today going to discuss the rasterization algorithm. So the rasterization algorithm is uh, just the algorithm that is implemented on GPUs. Like when you um, use the GPU via a 3D API, like for instance, Direct3D or OpenGL or Vulkan, and you go through the default machinery of those APIs, then what you use is the rasterization algorithm. And we're now going to discuss this algorithm in detail. And as a matter of fact, we already discussed most of the constituents of this algorithm like the portion of this algorithm that are important for our discussion, we already talked about in the background section. And what we're after is a more formal definition of the algorithm. And therefore, we will start with a serial definition. And that will allow us to um, analyze the uh, runtime complexity. And then later, we will also consider parallel formulations of the rasterization algorithm. And therefore, we have to consider what is the actual input to the rasterization algorithm. And the input to the rasterization algorithm on a higher level are, um, are polygons. And we will just define that the input, and this is, this is in line with how graphics APIs behave, that the input is actually a list of vertices. And we just assume that every uh, three vertices uh, form a triangle. Like um, this doesn't necessarily restrict generality as our pipeline would also support uh, other types of polygons. But what we're basically interested in is that those polygons are coplanar and um, the polygons should be coplanar with respect to the vertex positions. So um, each vertex is comprised of a vertex position. So a tuple in, in the R3. And then, in addition to that, there are other possibly user-defined vertex attributes that can be stored with the vertex. Like, for instance, normal vectors, which would be uh, tuples in R3, and, and the uh, vector associated with that would be, uh, the, would, be a, would be a unit vector. And we'll, we'll also have uh, texture coordinates or uh, vertex colors, which are just uh, other tuples and other attributes that are associated with each with each vertex. Like uh, this is a relatively general formulation. Um, one thing that we should uh, should note here is um, that in an in an actual implementation, we would probably also have something that is called an index buffer, and the index buffer actually has uh, several implications, and those uh, implications, for example, affect. How, um, how vertices are internally buffered in internal caches. And this is, um, th those are topics that we will uh, later discuss, like when we're discussing actual GPU architectures. But uh, for now, um, we're just assuming that there is a list of vertices and there is no vertex reuse, and thus there is no need for an index buffer. And we are simplifying, we are simplifying the model in this regard. So another input is the, uh, is the material library that we already talked about. So we uh, have a uh, set of materials and those materials store material properties and also potentially textures. And uh, via the vertex IDs, we can uh, access those material, uh, material properties. So whenever we evaluate the uh, color that we want to assign to a triangle that we, that we earlier um, scan converted, uh, then we refer to the material library and to the textures that are stored in the material library. And then we'll uh, also have a list of light sources. And other than the very general light sources that I introduced earlier, when, when I talked about emissive meshes and about uh, triangle meshes being light sources, um, we will assume a much simpler model. And in this uh, simpler model, light sources um, are really just point lights. So when we specify in our model a uh, light source, uh, we do this by just providing a list of uh, positions in R3 and um, light intensities that are associated with each of uh, those positions. 
Um, another input to our rasterization pipeline is uh, something that I will just uh, call a shader function. So you can basically think of uh, the shader or shading function uh, as a BRDF. Like think of it as a as a function, and the uh, function uh, has as input um, the uh, two uh, incoming and outgoing light directions that we uh, discussed when we when I when I introduced uh, BRDFs. And when I introduce material properties, and also and and, and this input also has um, pointers to the material properties, so that the uh, function can identify its, its its material properties. And another input is the uh, light source that we're evaluating the BRDF for. And based on this input, the shading function will uh, perform calculations, and those calculations are will will be comprised of of for instance, evaluating BRDFs, maybe taking uh, material colors into account. And we earlier learned that uh, colors are, are actually spectral power distributions. But uh, the shading function uh, can actually, like when we don't have, when, when we have inst when we instead have um, RGB tuples associated with the materials, then um, the shading function might, for instance, evaluate the BRDF and then multiply the BRDF uh, by the RGB tuple and uh, return this, um, this weighted RGB tuple. So in general, the shading function is a function um, that, uh, given these inputs, returns a color tuple. And the uh, shader function is something that kind of abstracts away what, what is happening there. Like in the architecture sessions, we will later learn that the pipeline supports um, programmable shaders. That is, the behavior here is not fixed and, uh, and configured, but the uh, behavior can instead be programmed. And this is the reason why I'm uh, not calling this, the, uh, this a BRDF, but I'm instead calling it a shading function. And by that, I'm, um, I'm insinuating that, that the programmer actually uh, can, uh, can influence what happens here. The um, input is also comprised of a virtual camera. And we represent the camera via the camera transformation. And the camera transformation is comprised of both the extrinsic camera parameters and the intrinsic camera parameters. And the matrix that is associated with the extrinsic camera parameters we will uh, denote as MV, as, um, as the model view matrix. And the matrix that is associated with the uh, intrinsic camera parameters we will denote as the projection matrix and both matrices are 4x4 matrices that, is, that allow us to transform vectors in homogeneous coordinates. So in, ad in addition to that we will also need to specify the, uh, view the viewport and the viewport is basically just a rectangle uh, which is comprised of yeah, usually an origin, a 2D origin like an XY coordinate and the width and height of the viewport. And uh, those parameters, they allow us to position and orient the camera in space. They allow us to modify the perspective of uh, the rendering and they also allow us to, to identify the um, region that is actually vis visible. That's, that is, they allow us to form the, the uh, visible frustum. So in the output of the rasterization algorithm is actually much simpler than that, at least when it comes to listing the output on a slide. And the output is, a, is, ju is really just a raster image, a raster image I with dimensions that are proportional to the viewport uh, from the input data. So with that, we'll, we can, on a single slide, write down the algorithm rasterization. Let us just walk through this algorithm real quick. Like the algorithm rasterization will uh, retrieve its input, like the input that we discussed, like the list of vertices, the material library M, the list of light sources, the shading function, the uh, camera matrices and the viewport, and then it will operate on the vertices. And this is um, basically just a uh, for loop over all vertices and I'm grouping them together here, indicating that they are triangles. And the uh, first thing that happens is that we apply uh, the camera transformation to the vertices. And this transforms our vertices into the clipping coordinate system. 
In the clipping coordinate system, we will clip those vertices uh, that are outside the visible frustum. And then with the remaining vertices, we will uh, generate triangles that, that are uh, still valid and still visible after clipping. So in, uh, only with those triangles, so with the triangles that we um, received after we clipped vertices outside the visible frustum, we perform scan conversion. That is, um, we iterate over this list of triangles that we generated, and then uh, for each triangle we generate fragments. Like we use a scan conversion algorithm, like for instance the algorithm by Pineda, and we'll generate fragments for each of those triangles. So, and then follows in, uh, in, a, in another nested loop a uh, iteration over the individual fragments that we generated uh, during scan conversion. And we iterate over the fragments, and then for each fragment we um, perform shading operations. That is, we apply the shading function, and for that we use the various inputs. And only after we have shaded the, um, the fragment, and after we have performed lighting operations, we perform depth and blending operations in order to write the fragment uh, into, the, into the depth and into the frame buffer. Let us in fact discuss those uh, various steps that the algorithm takes in a bit more detail. Like the first steps, the transformation step and the clipping step are what we will later commonly refer to as the vertex phase. And I'm just assuming that there are efficient implementations and efficient algorithms for what uh, happens at those stages and even more so um, for the transformation and clipping operations I assume that there are constant time operations and constant time algorithms that can be used. So the uh, very first phase of the algorithm is the so-called uh, vertex phase and the vertex phase is uh, followed but, but by what I will call the primitive assembly phase. And the terminology I'm using here is uh, very much inspired by um, what the graphics APIs uh, call the phases of this algorithm. And so we're already transitioning here from a very formal theoretical description to a description that is in line with what graphics APIs do by using the very same terminology here. And what happens on the, um, like, what, what our algorithm does on the primitive assembly phase, the algorithm retrieves as input uh, vertices, and those vertices form triangles. That is, the input is, uh, is, is really just triangles. And then what happens is um, that we uh, clip several of the vertices of those triangles, and therefore we happen to generate new triangles, right? Like, as uh, due to clipping, when we have a uh, triangle or a polygon in general that we clip against a, uh, a, a frustum, then what happens is that we um, introduce, potentially introduce even more vertices because we will end up with an intersection polygon and that intersection polygon is not necessarily a triangle again, but it will be a general polygon and then we will have to tessellate it again. And like as a matter of fact, the number of triangles that uh, we we um, emit during this process is uh, bounded. Like we cannot just we will not for each triangle just generate an arbitrary number of triangles, but the um, number of triangles is actually bounded. And it is actually not so hard to comprehend what the upper bound for the triangles generated during the primitive assembly phase actually is. And therefore, we just consider the um, polygon with the maximum number of corners that can result from a box triangle intersection. And the reason why they can use a box is because we're, we're for clipping, we're already in an orthographic coordinate system. That is, we already applied transformations that transformed the frustum into a cube. And therefore, we uh, can just compute uh, a cube triangle intersection. and. Let's, let's actually make things simpler. Let's, before we actually intersect the cube with the triangle, let's just uh, intersect it with the um, plane that the triangle is embedded in. And we will find out that the um, maximum polygon there is a hexagon, right? 
like if we count the corners of those uh, of, of, of this polygon we will uh, we'll see that we end up with at six six corners and then if we clip the this hexagon against the triangle edges and we will find out that in the worst case um, after this operation um, we will we can end up uh, with with a maximum of nine corners and therefore in the worst case the polygon that can result from a from from the frustum triangle uh, clip operation is a, is a nonagon so a polygon with uh, nine corners and given a nonagon if we wanted to tessellate that with only triangles um, we would end up with a twist tessellation like this like with what we call a triangle fan and uh, with, if you count the uh, triangles you will see that uh, the number of triangles is seven so with that we know an upper bound for the number of triangles that that we will produce during primitive assembly and the uh, upper bound just happens to be seven so and with that we have a fair understanding of what the primitive assembly phase does and we also understand what the uh, what the output of the primitive assembly phase is bounded by and the next phase uh, that uh, follows after the primitive assembly phase is the fragment phase and the fragment phase is uh, initiated by the scan conversion uh, step like um, when we discuss GPU architectures we will uh, find that the uh, scan conversion step itself doesn't belong to the actual fragment phase but it just initiates the fragment phase so we're now in a situation where we iterate over the triangles that were emitted by the primitive assembly phase, like we, we've computed our clipped triangles, and those are the triangles that actually uh, that are like in, a, in an actual implementation on a GPU are passed to what is called uh, called the raster engine, and the raster engine will perform scan conversion and will turn triangles into fragments. So on, um, what follows after, after this uh, scan conversion step that is performed by, on a GPU performed by this dedicated uh, hardware unit by the raster engine um, is the so-called fragment phase. And the fragment phase is um, comprised of shading all the fragments. Right? And uh, then on a, when we're on a GPU, the fragment phase is a, a programmable phase. Like uh, I express this here by passing for each uh, fragment this uh, this shading function uh, that basically uh, expresses that that this is a uh, a phase where the uh, programmer can have an influence about uh, about what happens. And um, after we computed the lighting operation, we we uh, pass those uh, those uh, fragments to the depth test and to the alpha blending functions. And those will populate the depth and the frame buffer. And you can see um, a, a peculiarity of uh, the fragment phase here. And what you will notice is that we perform lighting before we perform the depth test. And that is a reason. Um, the reason being that uh, this pipeline, the pipeline I'm describing here, supports uh, semi-transparent -trans surfaces. That is, um, we don't know in advance if a, uh, if a fragment uh, will actually be occluded by another fragment, we would be able to find that out via the depth test. But we also take potential semi-transparent surfaces into account, and therefore we have to perform the shading operations um, before we perform the depth test. A couple of remarks about this algorithm and about certain assumptions that I'm making, like for instance, you will sometimes see variants of this algorithm where the uh, shading and lighting calculations are actually not performed per fragment, but uh, per vertex. And the technique that is associated with that uh, would be called Goro shading. And then in such a pipeline, you would, um, instead of per fragment, you would um, compute per vertex lighting and then determine a color with regards to the shading and lighting at the vertices and then later the raster engines would interpolate those shaded colors over the surface of the of the triangles or of the polygons so this approach is a bit different and i'm very specifically um, using this 
formulation here where lighting operations are performed per fragment. And those APIs that uh, perform the lighting operations per vertex are actually a fairly old. Like this is uh, from a time where per fragment operations were actually uh, quite costly and therefore one would optimize uh, things a bit by performing the operations only per vertex and have the per fragments operations being a, a simple interpolation. You might, so you might see uh, this variant out there. In uh, my opinion, it's not very relevant because nowadays um, when we perform 3D rendering, we usually um, do this in a way where lighting is calculated per a fragment, but there's also this other variant out there. And you also see the uh, formulation of this algorithm explicitly supports semi-transparent geometry. So and on the one hand, there's this necessity that lighting is performed before blending. So we cannot optimize here, like um, only compute lighting for uh, fragments that we, that we uh, know for sure we will actually see. But um, because we are blending, uh, we don't really know if we, uh, if we end up seeing the fragment or if we don't. And therefore we have to compute the lighting before we blend the colors. And another thing that is not, um, not directly obvious, blending of semi-transparent surfaces has to happen in visibility order. And 3D APIs, like Direct3D or OpenGL or Vulkan, actually make guarantees about that. Like um, the APIs specify that the order that fragments are retired to the units that perform the blending operations, the, the, the ROPs that we'll learn about later, those APIs make a guarantee that uh, the order of those fragments is the exact same order that the user specified their polygons and triangles in. So there is no guarantee about uh, the order in which the triangles are processed and also there's no guarantee about um, like for instance the shading functions and the order in which those shading functions are called for the fragments. Um, the only guarantee that, that is there is that the blending operations will be performed in the very same order that the triangles and or polygons were specified in. And this is also important for our algorithm, like we have to assume that the order uh, that fragments are retired to the blend operation is actually the same order that the triangles are specified in. So now that we have a thorough understanding of how the rasterization algorithm works, we should try and analyze its complexity with regards to runtime. And like the uh, rasterization algorithm consists of a bunch of different uh, primitive operations. And as a prerequisite, we should get, get a feeling for the complexity of the individual operations, or we should, should make some assumptions. And like for the uh, primitive assembly phase, we already saw that the maximum number of triangles that can be generated during that phase is uh, bounded by seven. Like when we clip whatever triangle we have against a, uh, a frostum, then there is just a constant multiple of the number of triangles that we uh, can generate through this. And this is of course good. Like um, that would be actually pretty problematic when the primitive assembly um, would be able to produce an arbitrary amount of triangles, but we already saw that the uh, number of triangles generated from the primitive assembly phase for a single input triangle is bounded by seven. And so that uh, loop over the uh, triangles, over the set of triangles T from primitive assembly is also bounded by seven, by a constant factor. And then uh, we make the assumption that the number of fragments for a single triangle that uh, can be generated uh, is bounded by the viewport size, yeah, by the, effectively by the screen resolution. Like um, when we scan converted a triangle, uh, the maximum number of uh, fragments is uh, bounded by the viewport size because we assume that fragments that are invisible get, uh, uh, will not uh, be entered in any buffer and will uh, thus not be, be will thus later not be processed because it's just invisible. And then we assume for simplicity that um, for those uh, various subroutines, like the um, subroutines, red subroutine for the transformations and for clipping, uh, 
and for the shading operations, for the depth test and for alpha blending, and also the subroutine that generates triangles during primitive assembly, um, that those are constant time operations. Like we just assume that there is an that there are efficient and even even more like that, there are constant time algorithms out there that uh, we can just make use of. Um, this is like a general assumption, but like for instance, when we um, consider the transformations operation, this is basically just a, a bunch of matrix vector multiplications um, with uh, four vectors and four by four matrices. So those are actually constant time operations. And we can, for each of those operations, actually find simple constant time operations. And, uh, and then uh, there's the scan conversion algorithm. Uh, like the scan conversion is algorithm is uh, quite obviously bounded by um, O of the viewport size because we will only ever consider a single triangle during scan conversion and that single triangle can at most cover all the pixels of the screen. And based on those assumptions it is uh, fairly easy to uh, estimate the runtime complexity of the algorithm rasterization in terms of big O, and for that uh, we first see that there is a for loop over all the vertices, and because of that uh, the for loop is bounded by um, O of V, the number of vertices, and then we see that there um, are like a bunch of those operations where we agree that uh, there are uh, constant time uh, algorithms out there that we can just make use of. Uh, like the transformations, clipping, triangle generation, the fragment shader, uh, depth test and blending, they are all constant time operations. So those plug in with O of 1. And then we have this loop uh, over all the triangles from the primitive assembly phase. And there we agreed that this is a, uh, a, a loop that will uh, run at most seven times because we will at most have seven triangles that uh, come from the primitive assembly phase. So this is also bounded by a constant. The uh, scan conversion phase is a nested operation inside this loop over all the triangles. And the scan conversion phase um, is an O of uh, screen size operation. And so is the loop over all the fragments that are generated uh, during the scan conversion phase. So in the last loop we have to account for is the loop over all the light sources, like the fragment shaders executed for all the light sources, and this clocks in with an O of L, with L being the number of light sources. And uh, if we identify this, we can easily see that, that uh, there's a bunch of um, constant time operations that just uh, cancel out, and the uh, algorithm is actually asymptotically limited uh, by those three loops here, like the loop over the vertices, and the loop over the number of pixels, and the loop over the light sources, and we can also see that they are all uh, that they are nested loops, so they they count in multiplicatively, and from this follows that the um, runtime complexity that the in, in the worst case is O of number of vertices times number of pixels times number of light sources. So and on this slide you find the same um, runtime complexity again, yeah, like written a bit differently. Like we have our loop over all the vertices, we have that uh, constant loop over the triangles from primitive assembly, we then have the um, fragment shader execution that is bounded by the number of pixels times the number of lights, and we also have scan conversion which is another number of pixels operation. And this finally just boils down to um, big O of V times screen size times number of light sources. And for simplicity, we'll, in the following, when we're discussing the rasterization algorithm and its variants, um, we will assume that the number of light sources is also constant. Like we will assume this only for this algorithm and um, later when we um, go over to the deferred shading algorithm, which is actually also a variant of the uh, rasterization algorithm, we will reintroduce a variable a number of light sources again. Um, but for for the sake of the rasterization algorithm, that actually doesn't doesn't matter because 
Uh, this is the algorithm is actually only practical if there is a constant number of light sources. So we just assume that the number of light sources is constant for the sake of this algorithm. And uh, one thing I, I want to mention here is like practically speaking, the worst case complexity is fairly high. Like when we have 3D models, those uh, 3D models are quite often comprised of millions of triangles. And when we're, when we're only rendering to a, say, 1000 by 1000 window, and this is actually a small window nowadays, we're rendering uh, 1 million pixels. So, and that means we're processing 1 million triangles times 1 million pixels in the worst case. Like, uh, this worst case is, of, of course, uh, not always realized, but it's actually a very bad worst case. So uh, this should really be noted. Um, another thing that I, I mean, I can actually say we cannot do very much about this, um, this, this very bad worst case. But we will uh, try to better understand how we can mitigate uh, the effects from this worst case. And for that, I want to introduce just a second formulation of this algorithm. Like we have one, one um, formulation of the algorithm. I just want to, um, for the argument's sake, introduce just another variant of the algorithm. Like we'll make a bunch of slight modifications to the algorithm and um, I'll present that. So and the goal that we have in mind is, is uh, gain a better understanding of the algorithm. And we want to improve the algorithm and the way we want to achieve this is like like we will not be able to um, improve the worst case complexity but maybe we can reason about the algorithm in terms of throughput and come up with a version of the algorithm where we can maximize throughput here yeah, and here it is here is the alternative formulation of the algorithm rasterization now let's go through this let's uh, see what changed like what has changed is uh, that I split up those uh, nested for loops and basically uh, made them consecutive for loops. Like we have a for loop over the vertices now, and then there's a for loop over triangles, and that one is followed by a uh, for loop over fragments. Like, and let's see where that, how that works. And we um, we first perform all the um, what we called called the vertex phase, like the per vertex operations. We performed that on uh, the whole set of vertices, right? So, and I can, is that actually a subtlety? What, what you can see here is that I'm now not iterating over like um, triplets of uh, vertices, like over uh, three vertices, which form the triangle. That doesn't matter uh, anymore uh, with this formulation, right? Because um, only what we're doing is we're um, transforming the vertices, that is, we're applying a um, matrix transform to the vertex and then we're clipping it that is we're deciding if it is inside or uh, outside the view for them. and for that it doesn't even matter that vertices form uh, triangles so we can just um, uh, perform this operation just uh, on the triangles uh, regardless of their connectivity and only then we um, take those vertices and uh, generate uh, triangles after clipping from them that is we perform the primitive assembly phase and here's a, a important difference uh, that you should note, um, a difference um, regarding the, uh, what we did before on the primitive assembly phase, because on the primitive assembly phase, what we did before is we passed single triangles into the gen triangles function. And this is actually, this is now actually a different function because it will not only for single triangles, for single input triangles, gen generate output triangles, but it will generate output triangles for all the input triangles, so for the whole set of input triangles. And this, um, this set T here, like before, uh, the maximum size of that set was 7. And that is now different. Um, the maximum uh, set of the size is now actually 7 times the number of input triangles. So we also see, like, um, we, we, we need some memory here, right? So we need to uh, store those extra triangles. So and then we have a for loop that uh, iterates over all the triangles, not only over um, over like seven triangles from the primitive assembly phase, but over all the triangles that were generated from the whole primitive assembly phase. And by doing so, we generate fragments uh, using scan conversion and using Pineda's algorithm. And then those uh, those uh, fragments are with respect to all the triangles and not not only uh, single triangles.
or, or groups of seven triangles. And then uh, this is followed by a for loop over all triangles that we have, like in total. So, and what should be obvious here is like um, we split up those uh, different phases and as a matter of fact, um, by performing the split, we're actually now um, much closer to what GPUs actually do. Like, um, I mean, this is of course deliberate. Like, um, we, uh, this is what we are after, a formulation that is more compatible with what GPUs do. But also when we formulate things, like the vertex phase is like um, defined by the fact that uh, vertices are independent entities. Like before we were thinking of vertices um, and, and um, always had their uh, connectivity in mind. So we always, um, always worked on triplets of vertices. And it's not different, like we can now work on vertices um, uh, in parallel and as if there are completely independent objects and as if there was no, was no connectivity. Right? And we, well, what we see now is that we, um, like, like this, this gives us some extra flexibility but what we also see is uh, that we have to do a lot of buffering, right? Because um, right after the, after the um, primitive assembly phase, uh, we have to, uh, to buffer those triangles that uh, origina originate from that. And then we perform scan conversion, and a scan conversion actually will give us all the triangles, right? And so in this loop here, we have to construct a buffer that contains all the triangles. Like, and then uh, in the ensuing uh, fragment phase, we uh, work on all the fragments, and um, and not only on uh, a set of fragments that is associated with like a couple of triangles, right? So by splitting that up, we um, buy that with um, with a substantial extra uh, memory overhead. So um, we can we can already see that our algorithm is as the same upper uh, bounds with respect to runtime as algorithm one. This is the case, but because we have um, uh, because of uh, because of this uh, loop over the fragments, right? Like um, if, we, if we go back, we have a loop over all the fragments here, but um, this is not the loop over the fragments of a um, of like a uh, like like of like seven triangles, but it is a loop of the fragments with regards to all the triangles, of, with regards to all the input triangles. And the set of input triangles, of course, is, um, is uh, dependent upon the number of vertices. So uh, this uh, number of fragments here and the loop count here uh, is dependent uh, upon the number of input vertices times the screen resolution that we generated the uh, fragments for. And then again, uh, times the, uh, the number of light sources uh, where we for simplicity assume that it is constant. And so we see the uh, runtime complexity um, stays the same, but um, as we have to buffer our uh, triangles and fragments, the memory consumption goes way up. So and on a minor note, is that we what we saw is that we um, like like we have basically an extra buffer that we have to maintain um, or in a, a constant overhead for the um, for the triangles that are generated from input assembly, right? So like we have, um, we will start out with a buffer that um, stores all the uh, vertices, like the transform vertices, and then we have a, another uh, buffer that just uh, stores the triangles after primitive assembly. And we're just, uh, this is an, uh, what we're doing here is an asymptotic analysis, and we just assume that asymptotically this is irrelevant. Uh, like uh, uh, instead of uh, one buffer, we have two, and uh, both buffers are like asymptotically limited by the number of vertices times uh, some constant factor. And thus, asymptotically, it is it is irrelevant uh, that we have uh, two buffers here, like uh, one for the transformed vertices and another one for the uh, generated triangles. Well, in reality, this really matters, right? Because uh, this this adds this just basically adds another um, temporary buffer that is that has the, the same size as the uh, as the input, right? So in reality, this matters, and um, for our asymptotic analysis here, we just we just ignore this. So um, we can note that we um, successfully devised an algorithm that has the same asymptotic runtime complexity and has higher memory demands. Well, so we've been successful at that. 
and I mean, there's actually like there, there are actually advantages to this new formulation, and we will um, we will get a feeling for it, um, an intuition for um, why this is so in the following. But um, what I think um, really boil down to is that uh, fragment processing is now deferred, and uh, that me that's, this means we uh, only ever uh, perform per fragment operations when uh, we fully assembled uh, the uh, whole set of fragments. Uh, so we're basically what we're doing is we are deferring the fragment operations. And in the following, like um, we now have an, uh, we have those two algorithms and their uh, serial uh, formulations, those two alternative formulations. And the next thing that we want to do is uh, we want to uh, formulate them in a way so that they can run on a PRAM. And uh, we will use the work time formulation for that. And, uh, and then we will, we will compare the two algorithms and see where they exhibit parallelism. And we will also see how the two different formulations uh, actually affect throughput. So and here it is, our first uh, parallel version of the algorithm rasterization. And in fact, uh, you have to look very carefully in order to spot the differences uh, in regards to the serial version of this algorithm. And therefore, I put those uh, tiny triangles here so you can spot them. And for this formulation of the algorithm, like the changes are actually very little. Like this is what we see here is a work time of formulation of the algorithm. So the what I what, what I can do is just um, everywhere where there, where there is um, where there are no data dependencies. I uh, can just uh, put a, a parallel for loop there where, when there was a, a serial for loop before. Uh, so that's the only thing that I can do. So I have to decide for one of those for loops and the decision to put the, uh, the parallel for loop here to replace the outer for loop with the parallel for loop is a bit arbitrary. Like depending on how your um, work is distributed, it might also have been viable for, to, for instance, parallelize over the number of fragments. Uh, or like even over the number of light sources, like where we, where we um, earlier agreed or uh, assumed they are, they were just constant. Uh, so under that assumption, that, that doesn't make much sense. But um, any of those uh, four loops here would make sense to parallelize over, right? Like depending on how uh, those four loops scale, and I like kind of assumed that we have like um, many input triangles, and then it makes sense to parallelize over the input triangles. Um, but what, what this illustrates is uh, that I have to make a decision, right? So I have to decide which which work phase, so to say, to devote the parallelism for, and all the other per work phase phases I have to run serially in regards to uh, the, to this work phase that is parallelized. So I mean, we can obviously analyze the the complexity of this again. So um, the first thing that we should uh, should note is that the um, Parallel algorithm rasterization uh, requires CRCW, and this is due to the fact that we have a a Z buffer. So um, when we're like when we're in this phase, where we um, handle tr handle fragments and then um, retire the fragments to the Z buffer, then uh, the fragments can like be like like write to positions where other fragments write to as well, and then um, we have to uh, perform depth test or we have to blend the uh, the the fragments accordingly so that they form final pixel colors. And uh, therefore we need a CRCW uh, PRAM because here the uh, fragments enter a critical section. So this is the first important thing to note when we um, find f parallel formulations for the uh, rasterization algorithm. And the next thing is that it's kind of obvious is that the work complexity of this algorithm is uh, just the same uh, complexity as the um, serial complexity of the serial algorithm, right? So the work complexity is just um, v times vp because uh, nothing has changed, right? The only thing that has changed is that we put a parallel for loop here and uh, this, this obviously hasn't changed any work and we also made no structural changes to the algorithm that would, that would rectify a different, a different work complexity here. So the work complexity is just the same. So we're doing the exact same work that the uh, serial algorithm would do and we are not adding any extra work. So it hasn't changed. And the only thing that has changed is the time complexity because we're uh, now lifting this dependency uh, upon, upon V, right? Like where we before had um, the time complexity that was, uh, that was dependent upon V 
we now have a time complexity uh, that isn't dependent upon v because we're uh, doing the v's, the input versus in parallel. And let us now have a look how we would parallelize the second version of the rasterization algorithm. As you can see, uh, the second version of the rasterization algorithm exposes much more parallelism. Like we can just trivially parallelize the first for loop over the input vertices that performs the vertex phase of the algorithm. And the vertex phase is what, by what we, uh, is followed by what we call a primitive assembly. So the phase that will uh, generate new triangles from the input triangles and then put them in a buffer. Uh, we can just uh, trivially, trivially parallelize that because we can just uh, trivially iterate over the input triangles and uh, tessellate them. Um, we, we can then also uh, um, parallelize the uh, scan conversion phase because here, after the primitive assembly phase, I just end up with a buffer of triangles and I can just trivially iterate over that buffer of triangles and um, handle each of the triangles in parallel and uh, have it, uh, have it uh, generate uh, fragments and put them in a buffer. Like what you can also see here is that all those phases, um, like th what they do is uh, they append to buffers. Like we're, we're already on a CRCW PRAM. So therefore, we have to um, we don't have to to really worry about uh, that those are accesses where there's a possible contention. Um, but here, uh, here contention will arise, obviously, right? Because I'm uh, pushing to to a buffer, and uh, those buffer accesses will require some sort of synchronization because I have several processes that that are pushed to those buffers. So and those were only the vertex and primitive assembly and scan conversion phases. And then follows the fragment phase, and the fragment phase can also be parallelized. So. Like, and um, we we're earlier um, saying that we we're that we we're talking about three algorithms. And uh, the first algorithm we were talking about is the rasterization algorithm, and the second algorithm will be the deferred shading algorithm. And the deferred shading algorithm is basically an extension of the rasterization algorithm. And when we have a look at uh, what's happening here, is that like. When we, when we analyze those phases here, what basically happens is that I have a uh, for loop and the uh, for loop generates data, like generates transformed vertices. And then in the original formulation of the algorithm, whenever I transformed a vertex or transformed form three vertices, I would immediately after uh, perform the primitive assembly phase for uh, three vertices, right? So I would run over those three vertices and uh, and have the primitive assembly phase uh, generate up to seven triangles, like up to seven output triangles that uh, go into the scan conversion phase. So what I'm basically doing here is I'm deferring this. So instead of um, performing primitive assembly right away, instead, for the time being, just putting, pushing the vertices to a buffer. So then they're in a buffer. And only after, like, when, when the buffer is completely filled, or maybe, maybe, maybe when the when the buffer is like filled to a certain extent, like we'll later talk about this, how we about certain considerations um, with regards to how buffering is performed. But like, like only when there are then there's a certain number of triangles in the buffer, like for our purposes, when the buffer is completely filled, only then will we um, work over those uh, those uh, transformed vertices, right? And does that basically means that we are uh, deferring the stage where the uh, primitive assembly phase um, iterates over the primitives, over the over the input vertices, over the transformed input vertices, and that we buy that at additional uh, memory overhead. And this is basically it. We're um, we're basically doing deferred primitive assembly here. Like we're deferring the primitive assembly stage, and 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 what what we get from this is more parallelism. Like we can now parallelize the primitive assembly loop, but on the downside, we require more memory. Like we require an extra buffer of size, uh, number of input vertices. This is the whole concept here, and um, like uh, when we are talking about deferred shading, so I can already tease that out. What basically will happen is that we will also defer this inner loop here and make it parallel. And for our rasterization algorithm, we just assumed that the number of, of light sources is some constant, like eight 
or far or something like that. And so um, will not expose enough parallelism for us to really worry. And, and, and when it actually um, exposes parallelism, we pull it out, like we pull the uh, shading loop out. Like there are certain assumptions that we have to make later uh, to, in order to do that. Um, but basically what happens, we pull the, this loop out and uh, defer this loop and we buy it at, at extra memory costs because um, we have to, to store uh, additional data and additional information so that we can do so. And this is the whole concept. Like we, um, we're with this algorithm, we are deferring the ensuing work and buy this at extra memory overhead. And this is also important to note, like um, the whole point where we analyze the complexity here is um, to show that the work complexity and the time complexity in regard to the uh, first version of this algorithm stay the same. So this was true for the serial algorithm. The um, serial version of the algorithm wasn't affected by this uh, deferred uh, formulation. And the um, parallel algorithm, like the um, parallel version of the algorithm, is also not affected by, by us deferring the operations in regards to runtime. The only thing where complexity is affected is um, regarding memory consumption. And that is important to note. Like the uh, reformulation doesn't affect the asymptotic behavior of the algorithm. Like the algorithm now exposes more parallelism. That that is good, and this is also what we um, what we wanted to achieve. Um, but we didn't negatively affect the asymptotic behavior with respect to runtime. We still need a CFCW PRAM because the depth test still requires concurrent memory accesses. But this is something that we can just just cannot help, right? We're presented with relatively high memory consumption. So um, this is true, but um, it's also important to know that this uh, stays unaffected by the parallel formulation. Like uh, when we parallelized, we basically just went through the algorithm and replaced all the for loops with parallel for loops. Like this is, a, this is really all that we did. And therefore the uh, memory complexity of the serial formulation stays unaffected. I mean, this is the whole reason that we discussed this theoretical model. Like we have this theor theoretical model of the rasterization algorithm in its uh, simplest form, where we uh, have this, uh, this uh, one single parallel for loop over all the vertices. So this is a theoretical model. And if we want to analyze an algorithm like rasterization theoretically, uh, this is also a model that does just fine, right? So we can uh, analyze the complexity based on that and we can reason about the algorithm. But the whole purpose of this uh, second formulation that I showed you is to provide you with an understanding of how GPUs would implement such an algorithm. Like uh, the second version of the algorithm, both in the serial and in the parallel, uh, both the serial and the parallel variants uh, come very close to what GPUs actually do. And our reasoning here should provide us with enough insight so that we understand that there are certain structural changes to the algorithm, which make a certain, certain phases and certain stages of the algorithm deferred. And we should also understand that um, theoretically, the asymptotic upper bounds don't change other than with regards to memory. And so memory is actually a real problem with the, with the layout with the algorithm, with the with the algorithmic layout that we just saw, like with that theoretical model, and under the the assumptions that we made, we just need a, a lot of buffers that are just um, the same size as the whole input, and you can imagine that this might become problematic. Like for instance, when you have millions or even hundreds of millions of triangles, and duplicating those triangles all the time. Will be, will be problematic just in regards to VRAM, like in regards to DDR memory on the GPU, where you uh, just run into memory issues uh, pretty soon if you aren't uh, carefully designing your architecture in regards to memory consumption. And based on algorithm number two, like on the theoretical assumptions that we, um, that we made in regards to algorithm two, I will now tease out a theoretical model um, for how a GPU could mitigate this. And this theoretical model actually um, is a, a very good, very good um, foundation 
for the more technical discussion that we will later have when we discuss uh, actual GPU architectures. And such an architecture, like the, such a theoretical architecture, could look at something like this, where we have like an input stream of triangle vertices. Huh? Like we have an input stream of like an arbitrary length, and the input stream just gets filled somehow. Huh? Like we we'll, we are just have access to the input stream. And uh, we have um, three types of processors, and we have one processor that is devoted to the vertex phase. So you have vertex processors. And then we have processors that are devoted to the um, to the scan conversion stage, um, which I which I will um, abbreviate as RE, which indicates uh, that uh, that those are so called raster engines. And then we have a, a third uh, processor type, and that processor type uh, would be a fragment pro processor. Like uh, this uh, uh, processor type could run a uh, fragment shader on the fragments. So in our design, we would have we would uh, start um, with the uh, vertex processor. Um, processing and transforming vertices, uh, like um, performing matrix operations on the vertices, um, clipping the vertices, etc. So we would have a vertex uh, processor that would, in uh, in the first uh, time slice, operate on those vertices. And now that we're uh, working on those uh, first three vertices, like on the first triangle, um, we can we can like um, process uh, like we can st like start processing uh, more of the input vertices, right? Like we're stepping forward in the stream. So now that we are processing uh, the first triangle, like when we process the first triangle, the output of that would like, like we have the primitive assembly phase and generating more triangles, and the output from that phase would be edge equations. Right? Like we discussed the Pineda algorithm earlier, where uh, the Pineda algorithm would um, require edge equations, and the uh, the primitive assembly would provide the Pineda algorithm with edge equations, and the Pineda algorithm would uh, take the edge equations and make this decision if uh, if pixels are inside or outside the triangles based on the edge equations. So we have our raster engines, and the raster engines work on edge equations. So, and the trick now is that we have in between those two functional units, in between the vertex processor and the uh, raster engine, that we have uh, a small buffer, and the idea is really that this buffer is much smaller than the uh, than the than the input stream, like um, not nearly uh, the size of the input stream, but a small buffer. And as a matter of fact, the buffer is small enough that it can reside on the ship, uh, so that it doesn't have to have to be located in uh, in uh, GDDR memory, but that we can accommodate uh, this uh, small buffer in a ship. Think of it as like like it's like a small cache or something like this, like a like a small a buffer, presumably with, with memory, that can be accessed very fast and that uh, can store those uh, triangles that come from the primitive assembly phase. So we're basically having a layout where we have the input stream and now we have the additional data that uh, comes from, from us deferring uh, some of the stages of the rasterization pipeline. And we accommodate that using buffers, but the trick now is that we vary the size of those buffers. Like by having the buffers uh, really small, we can mitigate the effects of the of the high memory consumption that we theoretically had with the uh, PRAM and work time formulation of the algorithm. So, and now that our raster engines are processing the edge equations, we can actually flush out the vertex processors, right? The vertex processors aren't re required uh, for this first triangle anymore, and so they can start working on the next triangle, right? So, and then uh, the edge equations will eventually become fragments. So we have our fragment processors at hand, like in, and in time step two, the fragment processors should have uh, worked because the raster engines are finished. And uh, so we can um, provide them with fragments to operate on, to perform lighting on. And then again, we have uh, in between the two phases, between the rasterization phase and the fragment phase, we have a small fragment buffer, like a fragment buffer that uh, can hold uh, enough fragments for us to process. And uh, we would then finally re retire those fragments to the, uh, to the output units, to the, our, to the ROPs that we will discuss later. And uh, those ROPs would perform blending operations and, and would write the uh, fragments to the depth buffer. And you can already see that uh, this uh, forms a pipeline, right? Like I can now um, extend that input stream and step forward in the input stream. 
and perform operations on the input stream in a pipeline fashion. And this should illustrate why we went through this uh, theoretical discussion of algorithm 1 and algorithm 2. Like algorithm 1 is the basic rasterization algorithm, like you would learn it in a theoretical algorithms class, like in a algorithms class that uh, tells you how to render triangles. And the second algorithm is basically the theoretical groundwork for what GPUs do. And for us, it is important to understand that the complexity of the two algorithms is uh, the same with uh, respect to runtime, and that it is higher with respect to memory consumption. But when you choose a very careful layout, uh, then you can mitigate the effect from that and um, have a streaming architecture that exposes parallelism on several stages. So and an obvious problem with this architecture is uh, that uh, if there's significantly more work on one of the stages than on the other stages, uh, then we will uh, get load imbalances, right? Like uh, when the fragment processor has uh, much more work to do, the whole pipeline is dominated by the fragment stage, while the uh, vertex processors and the raster engines don't have any work to do. And uh, for those reasons, the GPU architectures nowadays use the same types of processors for both the vertex stage uh, and for the fragment stage. Uh, like nowadays we have something that is uh, called a, a unified shader architecture, which will uh, devote the same types of processors to those two phases. And we will uh, discuss this in much more detail uh, when we talk about the architecture, but this is something uh, to keep in mind. Like uh, this um, a very simple pipeline architecture here is uh, very effective when the uh, work is relatively relatively evenly distributed and um, the uh, this architecture has problems with uh, load imbalances and as a matter of fact um, those uh, load imbalances uh, were something that the developers had to uh, had, had to optimize for uh, like the developers were always trying to uh, balance the um, number of uh, input polygons uh, and the uh, screen resolution and uh, things like that and uh, trying to optimize their pipelines in a way so that not one that uh, one pip pipeline wouldn't starve. And nowadays, the architectures that we're having are more like this, where you have general purpose processors or processors that, that are, are capable of more general uh, purpose uh, instructions. And they are devoted to both the vertex phase and the uh, fragment phase. Those are theoretical considerations that we're making and later in the uh, architecture part, we will uh, refer to uh, this uh, general model and we will also refer to the uh, theoretical formulation of the algorithm. So um, what we discussed today gives us a foundation for our more technical discussion that we will have later during the course of the lecture. And here you can basically see the same illustration again. And where you see that while time progresses, we basically just stream data, we stream vertices uh, through this pipeline. And the pipeline uh, has all those uh, tiny buffers that can hold uh, single triangles and that can hold single fragments. And the three processor types retrieve data from that and process it and retire it. And the data is uh, streamed through the pipeline in a fashion where there is always only a uh, tiny amount of work that the um, respective processors perform in parallel. Equipped with this knowledge, we will now discuss another rendering algorithm, which is the so-called deferred shading algorithm, which is an extension to the rasterization algorithm that we just discussed. We will break up our discussion about the deferred shading algorithm into two parts. And as today already has been quite theoretical, like those are very practical algorithms that we're discussing here that have our real world implementations that are widely used and that are an integral part of the GPU pipelines nowadays. We uh, therefore had a very theoretical discussion and we will keep the discussion for today, we will keep it theoretical. And uh, then in the next session, we will uh, go on and have a look at how to implement the deferred shading algorithm in a practical way. And for today, we will only discuss it on a theoretical basis that is very similar to the discussion that we had um, in regards to the rasterization algorithm.
So there are some preliminary considerations with regards to the deferred shading algorithm. And first of all, we can observe we're already pretty near with the second, second variant of the rasterization algorithms. We already come quite near uh, what hardware actually implements nowadays like when we're on a GPU. So we already lifted some of the restrictions that the um, original rasterization algorithm had by basically using deferred operations and then also by assuming that there are some pragmatic solutions to the potential memory overhead. Like we saw in the theoretical formulation of the algorithm that there is relatively high memory overhead, but then we were assuming that there is like some smart implementation, maybe including uh, on-ship memory, buffers on-ship, that can mitigate the effect of that. And we're now going to lift our earlier assumption that the number of light sources is uh, constant. Like um, before, we were just assuming that the algorithm is not as asymptotically bounded by the number of light sources, that the number of light sources is just uh, not significant. And we're now, in, now lifting this assumption, and this makes uh, sense like for many um, like, like outdoor scenes, cityscapes at night, etc., and all those types of scenes. And um, quite typically, uh, you have those types of scenes in uh, computer games. And in computer games where you um, have to deal with many lights, uh, you will run into this problem that the uh, fragment phase of the rasterization algorithm will uh, basically repeat it over and over again for each and every light. And that's, of course, a problem, right? So in, um, we are now lifting this. But um, one thing I can already say is that when we want to lift this, we have to do this on the software side because the actual hardware only provides us with an implementation of basically what is uh, our algorithm rasterization tool. So we have the algorithm rasterization two available, and the deferred shading algorithm is basically something that is uh, on the software side, like the, something that a software developer would implement. And therefore, there aren't any smart solutions uh, that we have readily available uh, that we can, uh, where we can just use some on-ship uh, memory or something like this, right? So uh, instead, we uh, have to make do with what the um, what the uh, what the actual hardware provides us with and what the APIs provide us with. Um, we will uh, now discuss uh, theoretically how we can defer this light processing phase, which is actually a pretty simple extension to the algorithm. Like theoretically, uh, this is actually pretty sim simple. And in the next session, we will discuss how this is done with an actual um, 3D API. And for that, let us again consider our algorithm rasterization, but in a slightly simplified form. The form I'm showing here is basically the rasterization algorithm number two, like the second variant of this algorithm. But I'm just basically subsumming all those uh, phases that are executed before the fragment phase. I'm just subsumming them in a, in a single step and just call them vertex phase. Like uh, this is, of course, a, uh, an oversimplification. But the phases un up, up until here are, um, for the moment, n not of importance to us. So I'm just assuming there are like a bunch of phases that will compute fragments. And then in the end, we have fragments, and uh, we are now only interested in the fragment stage. And the fragment stage runs in parallel, like we saw it with the, with the second version of the rasterization algorithm. Now we're at the parallel uh, fragment stage. And if we briefly recap what's happening there is um, we have this uh, for loop over all the lights. And then we uh, shade every fragment with respect to each and every light. And then we perform the uh, ROP operations, the depth test and the alpha blending operation, right? So and the reason why we had to shade each and every fragment was because uh, we allow for semi-transparent geometry, uh, semi-transparent uh, triangles. And therefore, uh, we have to shade each, each uh, fragment because it potentially contributes. Like, um, if we were to, uh, to lift this, like if we were to uh, not perform alpha blending, we could instead, like there will only ever um, one fragment be the, the, the fragment that is closest to the viewer, right? So, and therefore, we would only ever have to light that, that one fragment. And therefore, in order to simplify things even more, we will now lift this restriction that geometry is potentially semi-transparent. With that, we end up with this version of the algorithm where we have uh, fragment processing, as happens in parallel, and then we have a loop over all the light sources that uh, shade the light sources, and then we perform the depth test.
people, when they uh, allow for semi-transparent geometry in such a pipeline, what they usually do is uh, they incorporate more than one render pass. Like you would have uh, one render pass that would just uh, rasterize the all the opaque geometry and fill the depth buffer with that. And then you would use a second pass over the transparent geometry and the, the second pass would just not use the uh, deferred shading pipeline. And then you would composite the uh, output of the two uh, passes. That is, uh, you would uh, basically just render the output from the, the uh, semi-transparent pass over the output from the opaque pass that is already in the depth buffer. So uh, this is what we are, where we're currently at. We're at a not yet deferred formulation of the algorithm rasterization. Like we still have a loop over all fragments uh, and we have a nested loop that runs over all the light sources. And when the number of light sources becomes uh, significant, we basically have that um, O of F times L loop here, which uh, can, to lead, can lead to exploding runtime. Like, and this is, as a matter of fact, this is a real, uh, so this is a real world problem. We're not discussing this out of theoretical considerations, but this is really a real world problem. Like the algorithm rasterization, like it is implemented on GPUs, even nowadays, is uh, bounded by the number of light sources. And as a matter of fact, APIs even uh, restrict how many light sources you can use when you go through the fixed function pipeline paths of, uh, of the GPU APIs. Like for instance, when you use OpenGL and when you uh, don't use the programmable uh, shader code path to perform the lighting, well, where, where you just could uh, pass in a dynamic buffer of light sources, but if you instead use the light sources that the fixed function pipeline provides you with, uh, then the number of light sources uh, is restricted to uh, something that is uh, specific to your uh, GPU and your uh, driver version, but it's, it's usually not higher than 16. So, and based on those uh, simplifications that we made, like we um, assumed that we don't perform alpha blending, we can now defer uh, the lighting pipeline. And we do this by basically uh, switching depth test and shade. Right? Like here, we have uh, first performed shading and then the depth test. And uh, we are now switching this. And we have the depth test write an output, like the output that was earlier just communicated to the render output stage. Like, and we can assume this happens in hardware. Like the depth test will, in, like in hardware, produces, yeah, produce pixels. Like um, after the depth test, we really have pixels. The fragments are composited to what we would call a pixel. And when in the um, hardware GPU pipeline, uh, those pixels uh, would, uh, like we, we would never have anything to do with those pixels. They would just directly be commu communicated to the, to um, whoever is responsible for displaying them, like to the display adapter. Huh? And we're now uh, deferring that that by um, by switching depth test and shading, and that means we have to be able to uh, temporarily store pixels. That also means um, the hardware has to uh, give us give us to provide us access to the pixels somehow. Uh, this is assuming we can access the pixels somehow after the fragment shader ran. And only after we have composited all the pixels, we would start processing light sources. So that means we have just another buffer, a buffer that the pixels go in. And then we would um, loop over all the light sources and shade pixels, right? Like before, we were uh, shading fragments and we would now instead shade pixels. And this is significant because uh, we have potentially, like before we resolved uh, visibility, we have potentially many more fragments than we have pixels. While for the number of pixels, we actually have an upper bound. Like the number of pixels that we will shade is uh, the upper bound is just the uh, screen resolution. This uh, reduces the work that we have to do to process lights significantly. So, and that just assumes that uh, light intensity uh, affects each and every pixel. And we will, when we talk about practical implementations of the deferred shading algorithms, we will also learn that we can make use of the fact that uh, light is attenuated with distance. So it will uh, not reach uh, every feature that is visible in the rendered scene. So certain 
3D structures will be unaffected by light sources and we will see uh, how we can reduce the complexity even more by taking uh, light and by taking uh, light intensity attenuation into account. But we should really discuss that in the light of an actual implementation. So in the next session we will discuss uh, the complexity of the algorithm rasterization deferred. We will uh, see how the complexity affects memory consumption and then we will discuss an implementation of the algorithm that is tailored for GPUs and we will also see how the algorithm uh, works around uh, certain restrictions in regards to memory consumption. And I hope you tune in next time when we discuss all this.